filter through. Oh. Mind your P's and Q's for recording this. <laughs> uh, hello, folks. Uh, we'll just give it a minute or two to allow more attendees to join us. Welcome to our third session of the first day of the Scottish International Film Education Conference. Um, I've already introduced myself several times, so just skip me. Uh, we're going to look at the challenges of practical filmmaking in the classroom, and I suppose some of the rewarding aspects of practical filmmaking in the classroom, and um, specifically in the Scottish context. Um, as usual, Pascal will put this in the chat, but if you have um, questions, there's Pascal waving at you. Um, you can either just type them in the chat, or you can use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of the Zoom panel. Um, if you want to speak your question, let us know that in the chat, and we'll have a look through the attendees list and, and bring you onto the, to the screen. Okay, that's everything from me. I'll just maybe say it before we start off in case I forget at the end, we do have one more um, panel, well, not a panel, a Q&A on um, today, which is at 7.30 with Academy Award nominee uh, film director and writer, John Sales, that's at 7.30. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be good to see some of you guys there as well. Uh, oh, one more thing, uh, Jacqueline is having some Wi-Fi issues. Both Jacqueline and Tom, uh, Fraser, the troopers that they are, are doing this from school after a long school day. So there's a few Wi-Fi glitches on Jacqueline's end, which is why her camera is turned off. Okay, over to you, Jacqueline. Uh, hi, um, my name is Jacqueline Thompson. Uh, I'm a teacher of media and English in John Paul Acad Academy in Glasgow City Council. Um, I've been teaching here for nine years and I've been um, responsible for media for the past sort of six or seven. Um, myself and Michael Daly, a panellist who will be joining us later, um, started by bringing in National Four and Five and now it's built to the point that we teach media from S1 in a sort of school of media format um, right up until fifth and sixth year when they do higher. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of fun. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, <laughs> uh, Hi everyone, my name is uh, Fraser Johnson. I teach uh, film media here in St Mungo's in Falkirk. Uh, I've been teaching media for about the past eight years. At, at my probation year, it was English based, and then a job for a full time media post came up, and I went for it, and I got it, and been teaching media ever since. Only in the past four, maybe four years, we've been teaching S one and S two media which has been great in terms of numbers. But up until then, we only had National 4, 5 and higher media. So since this has happened as well, the uptake in terms of from S2 to 3 has been great as well. We've had the help of our wonderful uh, English department helping us teach the other classes as well. So everyone gets a taste of media before they're able to choose their subjects, which is great to see. Uh, also on top of that, uh, the past three years, maybe four years, I'll be running the NPA film and film industry course, which has been great. But what I've done is I've kind of remodeled it and kind of renamed it as film school. It's like more of a market employee, to be honest with you. But it, that's been great, focusing a lot more on the practical filmmaking side rather than, than the theory. It's also because there's no advanced higher media. So higher media candidates want to stay in the department and still want to be involved in making films. But nowhere else to go. So that's partly why we started the film school as well. So that's my experience and I'm looking forward to chatting more about all this. Jacqueline? Oh, is it? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, can you, uh, Fraser, I actually didn't realise that you delivered media in the school to second and third year as well. Like that's brilliant that it's down in the lower school. Um, yes. what, I personally find it quite challenging to get them to differentiate media from English. And I find that practical filmmaking can be one way of doing that, that it's kind of more of an activities based thing and you can get them to go out with their phones, like phone cameras now are better than ever, and um, to work on different things. Like, do you, what's your experiences with that, with like getting the wee ones making things? Oh, again, I think there's going to be challenges no matter what, and no matter what school you're in with that. Basically, the and again, it's, it's, there's no uh, complaints here at all to, to, towards it. It's just people are, are used to their comfort zones. So, in, for yeah. example, the English department are used to having English based lessons, which is absolutely fine. They have the very much the, the, the talking to the class, they're sitting in rows and so on. Whereas, you know, yourself, Jack, when it comes to practical filmmaking, it's very difficult to make a film based in the one classroom. So, you have to try and get them out there. So, what I try to do is I try to balance it. 
and try to run CPD sessions and just getting the teachers more comfortable with filmmaking. We're lucky enough in Falkirk Council, we have iPads for every child, which is great. So at the same time, we uh, I, I try, I try and create short practical tasks. So for example, when we're learning about language, it's one thing set and talking about language in terms of framing and so on. And another thing going out and doing it. And you know yourself, especially younger kids, they learn more by doing. So that's the kind of main challenge I have. But at the same time, another challenge on top of that is basically it's almost it's disruption to learning and teaching. Because a lot of subjects aren't based throughout the school or the classrooms and so on, they don't really, they're, they're, they're kind of off, put off by the idea of having children running about the corridors. So that's, a bit, that's been a big challenge with that and trying to change that attitude towards that style of filmmaking and film education. Oh. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think that an attitude and a mindset shift is something that's like totally something that can be quite daunting. And um, we don't deliver drama in our school. So oh, there really isn't a lot of subjects that um, beyond sort of like PE where kids are up and about and in the corridors and you hear them and you can see them. But yeah. in the past couple of years with BGE Media, that really has been the case. And I think for pupils and staff sort of getting around that, no, they're actually they're doing something and it's, it's meaningful and, it, and it, it's needed and it's required and this is what they're doing, please don't disturb them, um, yeah. has been a bit of a challenge. Um, yeah. One way I've tried to get around it in S1 is we have, uh, because um, it's just myself and one other, now that Michael's moved on to Drum Chapel, it's just myself and one other teacher that's sort of responsible for the core of delivering most of the media lessons. But like, like you say, it's, it's often turned to English teachers quite often to like bring that into the English classroom and it's not really a natural progression and it doesn't feel very natural. It's really different to teach media theory and the societal constructs around the media text compared to a novel or a poem. Yeah, so it's totally. quite intimidating for an English teacher to take that on. Um, one way we've tried to get around that here is within S1 we have a media lesson every single week that is delivered by an English teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and these are six week sort of topics that were made that that English teacher then sort of becomes the expert in. So I've got an English teacher that's delivering S1, so a very pared down and basic level of narrative theory, language theory, and doing looking at cultural and technical codes, and um, looking at representation and cultural stereotypes, looking at society and the world around us. And that's kind of like the sort of theory part that they get once a week in their English lessons. Practically, yeah. they come to me um, as a double period during an IDL sort of insert that we get on a Thursday, where then they can come to me and learn how to do weekend tasks. And it kind of takes at least six months for them to put together that that thing they do once a week in English with their teacher relates to the thing they do with me for a double period. Uh -huh, no, and like yeah, they can kind of then it. start to eventually put it together that one informs the other, which oh. can be really fun. <laughs> 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 no, de de definitely. Again, you're saying as well, and I, I, I totally agree with this. That again, the the link between English and teaching media can be quite difficult. I think a lot of terms as well. It it it's, it, it can link in with more the social sciences. I think media as well, <laughs> especially the societal context as well. So, uh, for example, if you're trying to, to teach the societal context of say the Invisible Man from 2019. And then you have to talk about me too and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And that's not really brought up so much in an English lesson, more in a modern studies lesson. So there's a lot of cross curricular there as well. Yeah, of course. Um, Sorry, just yes, see interrupt. At the top Since uh, Michael has joined us, maybe. Sorry? Can... Michael has now joined. I don't know if you can see as uh, Jacqueline, but he's, he's with us. So if you want to introduce him as well and bring him into the conversation. <laughs> Yeah, oh. I was just gonna, <laughs> sorry, I know really <laughs> it's, it's hard for you to see with the, the Wi Fi going on here. Yeah. And yeah, I was just going to say that. No, I'm, even, Michael, I'm having an absolute nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> maybe even also to give us, for those uh, attendees who aren't in Scotland, give us like a wee explanation of like what is S1, what age are we talking about, and what kind of like SQA. Scottish Qualifications Authority. I've just done the thing I'm asking you guys to, to uh, think about. What what kind of thing are they looking for in media? Like, what is it they're asking you to teach the kids in terms of film and media? And then how do you sort of sneak filmmaking into that? Okay. Michael, you want to take this one? Yeah. 
Um, Michael, do you want to enter the chat and start us off? No pressure, mate. Um, I know. Um, right, okay. So, SQA, I think, yeah, media is so closely linked to filmmaking. I, I think one informs the other. I think um, if you've got your kind of eye on getting kids through um, higher, which is fifth and sixth year, so 16, 17 year olds, then yeah, to be able for them to be able to produce assignments, they have to essentially make a media text, which is as a film. You know, no matter what we we parcel it up as a media text, they have to make film moving images. Normally, they go to so, and able to do that to a high standard, I think we need to introduce film making as far down the school as humanly possible, and um, because it is quite daunting. It's daunting for us as educators to think about making film and teach film so I can only imagine when there's so much riding on a qualification and you're crashing the higher you have no experience perhaps of the subject um, and you're now being asked to go away and make a short film then that is quite intimidating so the way like around that I think would just be to try and embed film making in your school as early as possible so from the age of 12 and high school they are they're used to messing about with their iPads and they're given little tasks to go away and essentially just learning through play and getting comfortable as little film makers and understanding that film is for everyone, regardless of your complex needs, um, regardless of any barriers that you have, that film making is accessible and it's in inclusive. So that's that's how I kind of get around it, that it's, it's a requirement of media, but I essentially phase it into the journey as early as possible so that it's something that, that the learners are just growing up with and it's it's part of their qualifications and for them to think that they will be assessed in it um, really, really helps get buy-in. So that's kind of how I get around it and how I I parcel it is that we do film making all the way up and we just get to use film making for assessment. And how cool is that to have the opportunity to be assessed in film making? We just badge it as media about it and how I get around No, again, Michael, I could not agree any more, to be honest with you. Uh, with, I'm going to say that the, the sooner, it's, it's, well, to be honest with you, it's like the same way as you teach a, a child to read. Do you mean, it's, it's, a, it's a whole form of literacy here, especially in, in moving image literacy. So the sooner you start, the better it's going to be for them. And, and the way I look at it is, for, especially because uh, the way SQA is kind of set up, I use my BGE, which is basically from uh, ages of 12 all the way up to, say, 14, maybe 15 in some cases. I use that as preparation for when they choose media and, and for National 4, 5 and higher, which is ranging between 15 to 17, to even some 18-year-olds. And so I, I embed, obviously, because you can't have it all practical, they've got to learn something. So I do add a bit of theory to it. But the sooner they can get a camera in their hands and go and film make, the, the, the sooner that's the better. And the, the, the fact as well, Michael, as well, you, you said about the SQA is they don't assess the film itself. And you know what I mean, and, and that's for me, that's, that's just borderline criminal. <laughs> but, but, but I mean, the, all the, the research goes into it, which is great. Again, obviously, there has to be some validation with that. But the, the, the stuff these kids come out with, the, the imagination they have, for all to be not assessed, I think they should. They're always. I think they've been crying out for this for years on a a separate film qualification because media is such a diverse uh, subject. Whereas a lot of people feel comfortable with film. I, I, it's the same idea with multimedia, internet, print media. To to lump all that in in the one subject is doing a disservice, in my opinion. So that's why I, I say to my kids, it's filmmaking. It's not media, it's filmmaking you're doing. You're learning about film, you know? And and, and some of those, I, I guess I agree with Michael, the sooner you start, the better. It's kind of interesting that both you and Michael were kind of like, I do this and I do that in my school. As part of the, the challenge then, that there isn't a Scotland-wide approach. It's really like certain schools have really got a good focus on media and certain teachers like yourselves that are maybe a bit more confident and experienced. But when the qualification is media, there isn't that impetus for schools to really 
embed film into their curriculum in the same way? No, yeah, I, I think, remember when I, when I was at school, um, media in school is like learn about newspapers. <laughs> it was learn how to have newspapers laid out and so on. Sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> The joys of public schools. <laughs> that, that was a clean up, really bad. But, uh, so, um, so again, like I said, media should be split up into different areas depending on interest and specialty as well. So, and also the, another thing on top of this is the, the, there's, there's not a lot of folk who are fully trained in teaching film in high school because. It, I'm not, I'm not trying to brag or put anyone down here, but it's a case of, oh, this English has been given media to teach next year. You go and read the material and that's it. Whereas it's almost like, should we not be getting filmmakers and training them to become teachers or even run CPD sessions for teachers to be taught by filmmakers and techniques? And uh, I know for an end brand through in Glasgow, way they do that quite a lot, which is great to see for the GFT, Full Screen Scotland. But for me, it's the schools in between. What about them? They, I think they, there should be something in there for them. It should be part of the... Because, again, kids are surrounded by moving image media all the time. They're obsessed with TikTok. Obsessed with it. To the point that they, they, they constantly ask you for a TikTok. It's like, no, I'm a 37-year-old man. I'm not making a TikTok for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> that way, but it, it, as joking as that is, they should be thinking about, well, they are playing with moving image. And so, again, use that as a tool rather than trying to put to shove it out of schools. Embrace it, harness it for a tool for education purposes. Um, I suppose on that point, actually, Fraser, Michael and Jacqueline, feel free to come in as well. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. Um, have you noticed a change in the, the however many, I think you said eight years, Fraser, I don't know how long, Michael and Jacqueline, you've been teaching film and media. Have you noticed a change with the rise of TikTok in terms of young people? You don't need to teach them that much about, you know, editing, editing they can do on their phones and how it's set up. And, you know, yeah, I, think it's the ed- I think it's the editing. That was the one thing that as a, a teacher that's kind of self-taught and learned from doing like CPD within to film and really it being an extracurricular activity that just kind of organically moved into an academic space with Jacqueline and myself that Editing was probably the hardest thing to teach. You know, I, I think editing skills are quite tough. It's a lot of trial and error, and depending on the learner, they might get frustrated and they might. So to see how quickly they can edit using TikTok skills um, is really quite impressive. Like that's, that's something that's so difficult to teach, yet because they're using a different medium to play around with it and they don't think of it as filmmaking, that they're picking up skills that they maybe wouldn't have pursued before because it because it is a challenge. So in terms of that, yes, and it's about making them realise that no, you are filmmakers. You make TikToks. You know, it's about making them have the realisation that film is for all. And no matter what you're doing, if you're recording and if there's sound and you're thinking about kind of filters and stuff like that, then you're accessing film and you don't even realise it. And I think that's where in education we really need to capitalise on this kind of movement or or we're going to miss it, you know, and we need to really tap into that enthusiasm. And if kids think that, you know what, I could get qualifications in this, then doing something you enjoy, then, yeah, that's that's truly exciting. Yeah, totally. Um, I'd hire TikTok, let's do it. something something that I sort of noticed is that when Michael and I started teaching them little sort of pieces of filmmaking and we initially started with stop motion um, because some primary schools do a bit of that in Glasgow City Council and that seemed like a sort of natural link into here's something that you've heard of and you're aware of and something that's quite simple that we could do together and show you and Michael and I would suggest apps and suggest just different mediums for them to do it in but the more we've done it and with the rise of social media and with the rise of TikTok and Instagram reels, and we actually find that they are better at suggesting now the better apps to film these things on, that they've got far better experience and more access to, to making little videos than actually Michael and I do. Because like you say, Fraser, strangely enough, as teachers in our 30s, we don't sit and dance against the wall <laughs> and then Speak film yourself. them into reels. Um, but they do, and they've... Uh, 
that's something that I've definitely noticed. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> is that they are better um, coming up with suggestions as the best way to edit things. And I think that um, in terms of the hard evidence of that, the, the films that then, the pupils that Michael and I have taught together and then separately now, um, at higher and national five level, which would be that they've produced for their media assignments, the project part of the course, um, where they're re required to follow a brief and respond to something that creates an original piece of media. The quality of film that they have made over the past couple of years with their access to all these new apps and their experiences have also improved as a result of that. Um, and that is absolutely nothing to do with me or Michael. Like we literally couldn't do the, the things that they've come up with. And then you end up that the school now are trying to promote Instagram accounts for every department in the school to try and capitalise on this absolute obsession and need for social media and validation on social media that pupils have is that now they're trying to get every pupil or every uh, department, sorry, on with an Instagram account and posting regularly and everyone on Twitter making boomerangs and making things that will engage us, the parents, other professionals, teachers, pupils, like sort of just trying to get everything out there. Um, and I think like everyone has said so far, the earlier we can do that and the more teachers that can get involved with that, the better and the more that it will grow. It can only be a good thing um, and it can only enrich in the experience that young people are having across the school, but definitely within the world of media. I think that it would just open their eyes to the world of it to see that it really does impact everything and it, inf it, it influences everything. Um, which is definitely a good thing, although it absolutely has its challenges. <laughs> no, definitely. So, so uh, for example, the skills doing uh, Instagrams, it's like how to make an app not cool. But anyway, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> uh, so with that, um, for example, the TikTok stuff, again, I, I always go back to this because it's been such a great filmmaking tool. So I, I came across this video. Oh, got that noise, sorry. <laughs> Fire alarm test. <laughs> You hear that? We can't actually hear it. So okay, it's got to be Sorry, guys. Fire alarm test coming up. But uh, so basically, what I do is I've came across this video on YouTube about in-camera transitions, and I thought this is great, and it's so and it, you can teach us to S one, and it was so for example, it was like through the door transitions, like um, going in to someone's back and out, change location, all these kind of things, straff blocking. Oh, it was great. And uh, based on one th how, how I sold it to him was uh, it, it make your TikToks look better. <laughs> but at the same time, when I said transitions, all the kids knew exactly what I was talking about. I literally, I literally had kids going, oh, like this. And they came up with some amazing idea. Like It was like a, a hair flick thing they did as a transition. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. So, uh, so again, I'll get them to in their groups to go in their groups and practice their transition shots and see what they come up with. And the last one, they have to be as creative as possible. So the, the, what I'm trying to get across to them is, is, is the, let the camera do the work in less than editing. All you have to do is trim and put it together. And some of these shots that were, getting, were great. There's one, it was just the, the spinning chair that I'm on right now. It, 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 they, they got a shot of the chair spinning in and then moved the chair elsewhere, zoomed out, and the chair spun away. It was absolute great work. So, yeah, I think, like I said, it's definitely the way forward. And also the idea of a dolly zoom <laughs> as well. That's a, that's a function on TikTok now. They can press a button and do a dolly zoom. <laughs> See, when I was younger and you try and create my own dolly zoom, how hard that was. Do you mean that the, the technical proficiency you need to... So I move in and zoom out, and at the same time, you just press a button and it's done. I mean, how lucky can you get? Sorry, I, anyway. I was just going to say, I wonder if there's any flip side to that where they have to almost unlearn some things, or is that a thing where you just basically don't, don't, don't film in portrait, or maybe they, will, maybe they will, maybe they are making films in portrait, but is there any wee things that you have to try and kind of like reverse engineer a wee bit because they are so familiar with TikTok and social media and that kind of thing? Try avoid using the, the front camera for me. It's, the, it's, it's just an automatic response. It's obviously it's always the landscape, but they always want to film face on with a front camera as if they're making like a YouTube video to click and subscribe. That's one thing I've tried because mm -hmm. they'll use the other side, the better camera. Your, your filmmakers, that's your look, that's your screen to look at, not to record with. As that's that's the one thing I try to unlearn with them. 
Um, I wonder you? about your experience, Fraser. Um, I think that yours would be really different to Michael and I's because you're a uh, you're in the school as a media teacher, you're responsible for the media in the school, whereas a lot of Michael and I's time is spent teaching English and then splitting that with media and dedicating time to learning parts of the course and trying to improve parts of the course and like upskilling ourselves. Um, and I know you mentioned about is there not there not be a better way in Scotland to train teachers to teach media correctly? And absolutely. Um, because I think a lot of it comes down to your own personal time and commitment that you've put to learning parts of the course and making it as good as possible. Um, I was wondering how, what's your experience, Fraser, with, do you ever find that the, the pupils sort of, they outskill you in terms of what they can achieve, like in practical filmmaking? Because I definitely find that's the case. They are got ideas and they want to achieve things that it then takes me time to go away and learn how to do myself, just because they, they follow things that I don't and they, they, they watch all these reels and they watch things that I just don't. Um, until I go and make the point of going and researching them. I just wonder what's your experience with that? Oh, well, first of all, I'm a far better filmmaker than all my kids in my school. And secondly, I'm humble as well, obviously. No, but uh, a, few, a few years back, uh, we, uh, in fact, uh, we've got an ex-people just now who's went viral on TikTok for 20 million followers with our bacteria jewellery thing going on just now. I don't know if you heard about that, that she was an ex-people, an ex-media people as well. And she told me this idea she had, right? And I'm just going, cool, do it. <laughs> no, I have absolutely no idea how she's going to do this. What she did was um, she found locations all over Scotland because she was doing advanced higher art as well. And she, she, she made a painting of encompassing all the locations she was going to film. So then her story was that this, want to be artist went into the painting so i, I was like I, I was just trying to say how are you gonna do this it's like i've got ideas stuff that i'm gonna use the swimming pool i'm gonna use baths i was like okay i have absolutely no idea how she's gonna do this and she i said do my favor chloe can you send me some test footage of what you're trying to do with it and honest to god folks i was blown away basically what she did was she got a, a GoPro and the water camera. And what happened, the, the, how the transition worked was when the, the character put a hand into the painting, it would cut to footage of her hand going into water. But she obviously filmed it and flipped it around. So, and then eventually her hand went in and then her face went in, but she's cutting back and forth between the, her cutting through this painting and going into the water in a swimming pool. It was done so, so well. I was like, I would never have thought of that in a million years, how to do that transition. So I think in terms of, I think to try and compete with kids' imagination, it's a, it's a losing battle. You can never compete with that. I think the only thing we could do is try to guide them how they would do it. But obviously you get the one of kids who doesn't, they know exactly what they're doing. They go away and do it. And you just, and you just like congratulate them later on. But in terms of technology, for me is kids, with visual effects and special effects, apps. That's not my area of expertise whatsoever. So I get kids who know all the different softwares, like they do uh, computing in school and games development and all that kind of stuff. So they know exactly how to go and do these special effects. So I was like, I just, and you know yourself guys, like kids just know so much more about technology than we do. I think we can only guide them in terms of uh, how to, to tell a story rather than, how to go, or maybe some suggestions or changes you would make to it, but not exactly how they go and do it. Because I think they are, and already they have a plan of how they would go and do and make that film in the first place, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I came to the word that you kind of jokingly used earlier, Fraser, you said you weren't a teacher, you were a facilitator. But like, thinking about actually like what teaching is nowadays. Do you think media has that advantage whereby quite often we're told like we need to give young people more agency and it's not so much about us teaching them how to do things? Maybe it's, do you think it's still like that in more traditional subjects? But when it comes to, to filmmaking, it's much more of a, well, maybe not a level playing field, but it's a much more a kind of give and take thing. And do you think that partly explains why they produce such imaginative and creative work? Do they, you feel like they've got quite agency over it rather than kind of writing an essay in English, that type of thing? 
Michael and Jacqueline, feel free to come in as well. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, sorry. It, it was weird when I was when I was younger as well, and it, it, my my cousin who was a guy, like amateur filmmaker and stuff, and he something said, said something quite profound to me. But at the time, I'm sure it's different now, is because I was obsessed with going to film school after high school, and he he says the thing with film school back then is they teach you to make films like everyone else. That's if I, if I, I I don't know, obviously I know that's not true now. But at the time, it stuck with me. It's like, well, yeah, it's the same with these kids taking more agency. We could teach them to make films like other filmmakers. We watch and but watching behind the scenes footage and so on. But it's it's you're completely right, Robert. Giving the kids more agency with that and just let them this don't hinder it. To be honest with you, because kids' imagination again, I, the the last thing you want is to thwart that. Jack, can you go for it? Oh, sorry, my audio is really, really lagged. I only heard a wee bit of what you said. Um, I, I, I do agree um, that I don't want to hinder their imagination, but I, I feel like within like public schools in, in, in Glasgow City Council, you are restricted in loads of different ways with what is possible for them to achieve. School day, like you are restricted by location, really within the building or within the yard, you're restricted often by equipment. And while um, smartphones are better than they ever have been, um, not everybody in the school has access to things like that. So like equi it's not necessarily equitable for all the pupils that want to take part and want to achieve these things. And as a combination of maybe like their financial circumstances or their uh, their sort of ability, like when it, when it comes down to it, that they maybe have aspirations that are maybe more um, that is, is, is what's really achievable and that can be really frustrating for them um, and I wish that I could take all those barriers away when it comes to filmmaking because really like film shouldn't discriminate and it should be an opportunity for all and I think that there can be ways to bring down those barriers in the classroom when it comes to learning the theory of it all and sort of experiencing the joy of film together but I think that that can be more challenging when it comes to practical filmmaking tasks um, like even as simple as is like group work, the challenges of putting together groups for recording doesn't always lead to the most successful and the most productive periods. Um, just because God, like we've all got, as educators, we've all got experiences of things like that. Um, and I think that's really something that stands out as being a bit of a challenge and is maybe something that perhaps English teachers, because they tend to be sort of put in the media column, um, find the most daunting because it's so different to what they're expected to do within an English classroom that you kind of need to take yourself as a teacher right back and relearn the ways that you thought would be the best to go about teaching something. And um, if we're thinking about within the sort of Scottish educational framework, what's expected of higher English pupils when it comes to the portfolio is completely different and not really in any way comparable to what's expected of higher media pupils for the assignment. Like the word count alone is double, triple for media, um, and which is then often lumped in the, the column of it will get you to do media because you don't like English and there's not as much writing, you're just essentially watching films. When, when that's not in no way accurate, it's in no way accurate to the experience of what it should be for pupils that want to take subject. There's a lot of things within that bracket that can be really challenging and when that comes all the way back down into S2 and you get an S2 people and you give them the brief that they've to create something, something that we did this year was we used um, Disney's Aladdin, we looked at the original animation and we looked at the live action and we looked at the ways in which language codes were used to create similar effects and used to create different effects um, and then the challenge that they had was the, to go and make a one minute short film using um, a magical object as the stimulus and it could be anything it could be within really any genre you just had to take the idea of this object with you um and the the range of submissions for that when it by the end of the project by the end of the topic were great there was people making stop still there was people doing black and white and um, there was people doing or oh, just loads of different things it was brilliant but that first lesson or two where you're taking a group of like 13 year olds and saying i want you to come up with something creative but it's totally different to writing a story. And I know you've written stories in first year in English, and I know you've written stories in primary school, and I know that you understand what that means, but this is totally different. I want you to see it. I want us to be able to see it. And I think that that 
can be a real challenge for some kids to just imagine and to think of and how can I take something that's in my head and make it really visual because the only sort of practice they've had up until then is to put it into writing and to put it into words um so I think that's something that comes across as just like a bit of a challenge I feel like I just keep listing the challenges um it's brilliant and it can be really award it's really rewarding at the end of it all but I think that media teachers really are up against a massive battle um, when you set up your subjects to get rid of this stigma of we're just going to watch film and not do anything about it because really the opportunity to do everything about film is what makes teaching media so brilliant and so exciting and you can make it completely relevant to the world around us um, and I think the opportunities there are brilliant and kids really really do get involved um, Michael do you agree have you got any sort of thoughts to do with that um, I just think to circle back to Fraser's idea about like facilitating, I find the longer that I teach film, I just say to kids, right, how are you going to do that? You know, I, I feel I'm constantly just, and they must be sick of me saying it, like, like how, right, okay, that's the idea, I get it, but how are you going to do it? We have no money, so we can't get a helicopter, two machine guns, and a truck. So... How can we take the concept of what you want to do and how can we do it with no money using exactly what we have here? So it's almost like kind of guerrilla filmmaking in high school. You know, like what can we actually use? Well, we don't have a car, but we have a shopping trolley. So can we do that as a tracking shot? Would that work? And they're like, aye, sir, that'd be brilliant. I'm like, right, great. Okay, so we've kept your idea. We've just made it a bit more doable. So let's let's go. So I'm just a guy that asks questions really when I'm teaching film because they, they come up with the idea and I'm just like, okay, cool. How are we, we going to do it? And if, if we're thinking about like quite quite a lot of the time, we always ask ourselves about assessment and film making and assessment and film making. I mean, this is maybe controversial, but like it's not even just in film making. I think that we need to broaden our understanding of assessment and Scottish education you know like yeah a kid has to produce a persuasive essay like why does it have to be an essay in English why can't it just be produce a text because fellows a text and the wording of all the documentation from Education Scotland films now a text so why can't you produce a text that's persuasive in nature and I think we were really, really lucky. We did a project with Interfilm and Sharon Sorensen at Drum Chapel earlier in the year, and it was all about COP26 and, and climate change. So they made an animation about this, and it, it was just incredible. And, like, how is that not persuasive? Like, how is that not a persuasive text that they've produced? So I've taken filmmaking, and by broadening my understanding of assessment and looking at what it actually hits in terms of experiences and outcomes and benchmarks and all the all the jargon that we have to hit as educators in Scotland. That project that those children produced by using the external agencies and external filmmakers, that ticks every single box. So we talk all the time about media and the, the, the film's not even assessed and it drives us crazy and I think that's Truly how we embed film is by just opening up what we think assessment is. Because those the work those kids produced on COP26 was, was just incredible. But if I was to give those children a pen with their complex needs and say, right, write, write me 300 words about climate change in COP26, they, they, they might have just completely disengaged and shut down. However, by just having thinking outside the box, and taking advantage of into film and, and what they can do and their resources and their access to filmmakers and stuff. Um, we were able to produce something that, yeah, I think assessment really needs needs looked at and film is definitely worthy of its place and how we assess moving forward. Outstanding, sorry. So Michael, my point as well is, so many schools in the world are moving towards technology in a paperless world and so on. So yeah, yeah. why are we getting kids to sit in the hall and writing paper for two hours? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, it also, I'm going to answer Bernard's question about the screening and sharing critiquing student work again. So Bernard, what what I do is, is I don't really 
get kids to critique each other's work. Because what I what I try to do is try and create almost like a a, a, a film Sorry, collective. Fraser, if you can you read the question as well because the the attendees cannot read it. Fair enough. So Ben is asking, uh, do you organize screening and sharing critiquing student work in class and how? Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. So uh, like I said, I don't really get kids to critique other people's work because m maybe it's just because I, it's the insecurity in me. I wouldn't like people critiquing my work that I put my, from my heart and soul into it. What I try to do is I try and create an atmosphere in my classroom that creates like a film collective. They're all there to help each other make each other's movies. So throughout the year, uh, what I do is for the past few years from my senior classes, uh, I've ran an Oscar night to celebrate their work and so on. Um, so I've got two classes, uh, two senior classes. Uh, so that's probably 50 movies you're looking at. I have to narrow it down to eight on the night. And what we do is I invite folk from the industry. Uh, they come in, they help judge a panel and so on. There's awards given for different categories. There's entertainment, there's a, a host. <laughs> There's a whole spot. Um, but it's about the kids, though, and it's about uh, getting their work celebrated because usually in schools, it's the these are the kids who are kind of forgotten about, and that breaks my heart sometimes. There's so much talent in these kids and the films that they make that should be shown on the big screen. They should have a moment in the sun. Not not these kids are not the ones winning gold medals in the hundred meter sprint. They're not winning Scottish cups in football matches. They're not. Uh, winning the Ducks Award for the most A's in the year and so on. These are the creative kids who have got a creative space and have their work celebrated. And that's the kids I was trying to aim for. So I think that itself, the very fact that these kids have these works celebrated is almost a critique in itself, Ben, that, helps, that that helps answer your question. Because what I do as well is I try to sit lower down to the S2, S3 classes, which is basically you have kind of, you're 12 to 15 year olds. And I just recently had an Oscar day with my S3 class. So they're about, four, about 14. And we showed all the films, watched them all. And in, as a class, they had to vote for the top three films that they watched. But what I said to them was, maintain integrity in this vote. Don't vote for your pals or just because someone's playing football. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Vote for the film you think is the best. And that's the top, that's keeps the, the integrity of the vote. And to be fair, they did vote. And they voted right. They voted correctly. So I think if, it's all about maintaining that atmosphere and creating that uh, film collective and collaboration atmosphere rather than critiquing and celebrating the work. I hope that answers your, your question, Bernard. Thank you, Fraser. Um, Fraser, you Michael and Jacqueline, do you have similar... Do you show students each other's work, either in a kind of formal showcase thing like Fraser does, or just throughout the year, various points? How does that work? We kind of do it as we go. Yeah, so we do it as we go. I think it just creates that kind of teamwork ethic, because I think making a film is such a monumental task that there are so many moving parts, and there's so many things that other people can bring, and everybody's got their job. And I think that by getting them to do a kind of test shots and look at the test footage and stuff like that and go back and making sure they get safety shots and stuff like that and they're all involved and they all have a role really kind of gets that buy-in so we're I feel we're constantly watching film you know and it's I think it's more important as well to try and get the kids to kind of critique their own work I think is as a filmmaker, there's always going to be things that you are not entirely satisfied with when you look back at it and you're like, ah, oh, I really, I think that angle would have looked better or I could have done this with the lighting or did that. Um, so it's encouraging the kids to critique their own. I think it's when, when it's your art, you should be in the place to critique it, you know, and, and it's about you looking back and going, right, okay, if I was to take that brief on or take that project on again, what would I do differently? And, you know, and I think that gets really good dialogue going with the kids. Um, and certainly by encompassing the kind of team mentality when they are making it, kids are in a forum when they look at the test footage and go, do you know what, maybe we could love it this, you know, and they can kind of give their input throughout the process. And then it, it kind of maybe saves your film going on the screen at the end and feeling that people are attacking your art because that, that's not what it's about. And it takes so much for children to sit and watch their own work on screen. 
um, and to be able to share that. And I think by having a kind of team ethic, if I think back to our COP26 thing, the, 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 all, all the kids took part, you know, it belonged to all of them. So when they did look at it, it was very much a shared success for them. Um, so that that's how I approach it. It's like an ongoing screening, essentially all the way through the process. And then it just gets that teamwork and that kind of celebration at the end of it. Uh, yeah, I, I I agree with Michael. That's something. Oh, sorry. Um, I agree. That's something that I've that we've tried to build in here is like an ongoing um look and a sort of deep dive in across the the process of it. However, something that um I've tried to build in this year is this. I'm really fortunate here because because media is in the curriculum from S one up until S six. There's pupils that have been doing it for a sustained length of time. Um, and I've been able this year to sort of develop the idea of team media. Um, and it's meant that pupils who are in S3 now, they did S2 media last year, have been able to come in as sort of subject ambassadors and mentors. And then it's been the same for, for S4 down S3 and S5 down S4, sort of like pairing up year groups um, for feedback purposes, because they all had experiences doing this last year. and we were in your position and we've, we've got experience working at this and I found this really challenging and why don't you think of something like this? And it means then that it kind of opens up the, the idea of support, that it's more than just me and that while I'm facilitating the room, they've also got people to turn to in upper year groups in the school to show them what do you think about this and it really opens up the dialogue with it. Um, and I think the more we can do that, the better. Um, but it also gives the pupils that are mentor on, mentoring um, like a bit of experience within that field as well. That's a completely different skill to sort of harbour and um, to look at a younger pupil's work and to think of a um, like a constructively critical way to go about it. And if you thought of something like this and after a year's more experience, like this is the thing. Um, and it's meant that some of the relationships are really cute. Um, there's a pupil that Michael taught when he was at John Paul, um, who's in just left six year now, but when she was in six year, she spent so much time in the higher class um, going through their films and their assignments and just really wanting to be a support and a help um, to see them succeed and to see them do their best and we've had instances of that in every year do we all the practical filmmaking projects um, and it's really worked it's something that I'd like to develop more next year and um, we also with the idea of an Oscars night it sounds absolutely brilliant and I did see Fraser's reels that he posted on Twitter of all these S3 films and they're absolutely amazing like I, I would love to be at the position where we're producing films of that quality and that volume so that we could all get together and vote for them and that just looks up it looks brilliant oh, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> um, the this year the the year group that produced the most little practical filmmaking projects was S2 um, and we are also in the same position where every pupil's got an iPad um, and every classroom has been equipped with Apple TV. Um, so when it came to showing them the magical object films and we did another brief that was all to do with science fiction. Um, and then the last one was um, a Netflix um, sort of brief that they had about a, a cold opening that they had to produce. The pupils were able to screen share their iPad onto the board um, for each sort of little production company. Um, and go and give, give their pitch on what they were doing and this is what they thought of and were responding to, to this brief. And the, the more they did it, especially the Netflix one actually, um, the better they got at it and the better they got at sort of uh, fielding questions from the audience. They were, they were able to stand up and show people what they've done and be really proud of it. Um, and the sort of skills that that's brought out in the class has been brilliant. There's a proper wee actor that's just moved into third year that wants to be in everybody's film and wants to be the main part in everybody's film and like that is great like that's absolutely brilliant and I'm not sure that if media if media wasn't part of the curriculum and something that he could choose given that we don't deliver drama in the school he wouldn't have that creative outlet to get that across and he is a wee guy that's great at football and he's like he impresses in the English department that I work in and but media is a completely different thing and he was a spaceman in someone's film. He was a genie in someone's film. <laughs> like <laughs> that was great. A range. <laughs> what range? Um, so I'm sure he would have done really well at the Oscars night. <laughs> I just noticed that another question in the chat here from Paula Murphy. 
um, who has asked, what kind of criteria do you use to judge student work? What are typical assignments that you give them? We've got a wee bit of that there from Jacqueline with the science fiction. Um, but how would you, what kind of criteria would you use to look at their films and think, is it working, is it not working? Um, when, so when it's, when it's starting in S2, then I base the criteria on the key aspect that we've currently studied. So when we're looking at narrative, then, and I set them a practical filmmaking task, the, the thing, the criteria that I'm looking for within their film to do with that is have they addressed the hero's journey or Todorov's narrative theory? Do they have an understanding of Prop's characters? Have they used any Enigma codes? Have they, like I look for all the, the key teaching points that I've went over with them in the past couple of weeks, are they able to put them into practice? Um, that was something, that was a brief that we did uh, way back in September last year. Um, and that's kind of the case when it comes to S2. When it comes to S3, when I've already been through that, I try and put key aspects together um, and combine. Um, this year, I combined the to do something that was related um, and I combined institution, society and language and put the three of them together and was like, right, here's, and we did a whole bit of teaching about that. And we started with Nosferatu and went through the original Dracula and the original Phantom of the Opera right up to a quiet place. And we looked at all the sort of different, the range of horror um, that they can look at, teaching them about institutional uh, constraints, looking at um, societal influences and looking at film language so that then when they put together the film, when they put together something practical in their little groups, I was looking for those three things. Um, and the reason I do that is because when it, it, it all comes down to what the SQA are looking for. The SQA are looking when it comes to National Five and Higher, when you produce um, a piece of moving image content, that it does satisfy all those boxes and that they need to be ticked. And it can be quite um, like superficial. It can be quite cliched um, with some of my pupils anyway that are crashing or that came in as sort of a six year, I just need something to do or a fourth year, I didn't do it in S2, I didn't do it in S3. You find that they are, those pieces of media, while are great and while are totally a reflection of those people's abilities and those people's interests, the ones that have been in media since S1 and have been through S2 and S3, just understand it on a different level when it's broken down into those sort of little stepping stones. Um, when you break it, the key aspects apart and then put them together in different ways and different patterns. Um, and the, the part of the course that I personally find the most challenging is um, institutional constraints. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just something that I, I need to find better ways of te teaching it because I always get to that part and I find it challenging to deliver at SQA level. Um, but this year it's actually been really successful at BGE at second and third year level when we've used just when we've looked and we've focused on the BBFC and we've looked at what are the ways that you could change the content of a moving image film if you were given the parameters of it has to be a PG or it has to be a 12 or it has to be a 15. And we used Rogue One to look at that and looked at the different classifications of science fiction films and we looked specifically at Star Wars um, and then the things that they were able to produce because that was then part of the Netflix brief, is that they had to give it a classification and make sure that their piece of media fit within the classification boundaries. Um, that's personally the way I go about it. Do you do anything differently? Well, I go. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I get. I, I loved all those ideas. To be honest with you, like I've. For me, I'm a I'm a genre nerd, so <laughs> I love genre cinema. And for me, I find f assessing films so subjective. I mean, let's be honest, there's people out there who actually in enjoyed the movie Bohemian Rhapsody. I mean, I don't get it. I don't get it myself. But the people who actually enjoyed that. But <laughs> they, they, they didn't know digress. Basically, what I do is, I, I, my, my brief is they can choose what film they want to make. However, as long as it hits those genre conventions or genre markers, and that's what I base it on. So... Because, for example, if someone's making a romantic comedy, have you hit those genre markers? Doesn't have to be in particular order, but are they present? Same with horror, same with film noir. I've done with some S3 work, documentaries. Are they following the conventions of those? And obviously, they're still within the BBFC rating range. And that's, for me, like I said, with the SQA stuff, it's not the film that gets assessed, it's the paperwork. But as long as they tick those boxes and meet those criteria, 
then that's it. And then it's a thing on top of that. It's all a amount of taste as well, isn't it? Like, so you might like, was the kid might like something different that, that you like. So I find that very difficult to assess an actual film. But if, as long as it hits those mark, the, the, those markers, then that's how I assess it. It's interesting because you, you kind of mentioned working to the S3, Jacqueline, is it? In some ways, is it kind of like the cart driving the horse? Because it's not like the kids are encouraged to experiment with film as an art form and be creative. They've got to hit particular conventions. I suppose what I'm asking is if the SQA exam was different, what kind of criteria would you use to assess their films? Then? Would you be looking at things like framing, and character and that kind of thing? Um, yeah, but it, it, it's kind of what I mentioned about, I, I really like the way Fraser goes about it, but I, I think I would need to like totally dismantle the way I go about teaching topics to make it focused on genre. Um, and, I, and I do really like it like that. Um, but in my head, I, I, I'm, I don't think I'm confident enough to make that work. I think I would, I would need like the strict boundaries of this is what I'm looking for and these are the language codes that I'm looking for or here are the things that I'm looking for because I, I don't know whether it's... That they look the skills and then they all mount together to develop and sort of extended pieces of moving image. Um, yeah, Michael, do you have any th thoughts about different ways that you assess the, the practical filmmaking sides? Like, how do you, um, what sort of parameters do you use to judge or what criteria do you use to judge? I think it, it, it's, it's so subjective. And, and I think that's what makes assessing the actual film as a film extremely difficult. Um, I've, I've, I've had kind of vague tasks where they have to create a cold opening for a Netflix TV show that doesn't exist yet. Like things like that. And they have to come up with their own kind of Netflix original. But I think I'm at a totally different place in my kind of film teaching journey here in a new school where it's perhaps it's not as embedded all the way through, which is exciting. And that was one of the reasons that I wanted to come. It's genres, what the kids are so familiar with. You know, it's they have such a firm understanding of genre. Um, they've, they've dealt with it their entire kind of academic careers from primary school all the way up. So I think it's about maybe giving them something a bit narrower that has clear conventions, like they had a jump scare. They 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 started to use lighting in a certain way to get tone and moods and things like that. So I think genre is is perhaps the only way we could assess it without kind of sucking the fun out of it you know um i think if we go after kind of camera shots and we start talking to them about yeah like your sound wasn't great your edit wasn't great well yeah because they're kids having fun you know but i think in genre genre is a safe safe space where, where we can kind of not even critique we can just ask questions like how do you feel you did you know how do you how do you think you did as a filmmaker and I, I think that's that's how we assess it's almost like see, instead of peer assessment it's like self-assessment you know and I think if we like I'd kind of spoken about earlier if we open up what assessment actually means then you use the film to hit other markers and other kind of benchmarks in the experiences and outcomes that curriculum for excellence in Scotland wants us to hit for assessments and planning well yeah, the film can hit those, but we can still talk to the kid about, you know what, like genre, like how do you think you did? Like if this was a horror, is that a successful horror? Okay, cool. What made it a successful horror in your opinion? And that's kind of how we um, how we go about it, just more dialogue about it. You know, I think it's about keeping, I think sometimes the minute you attach assessment and it's, it's so rigid, then that could derail film making progress in a school you know as if it has to be light and fun and floaty and then I think it's our job as teachers to see right okay where where does this fit how can we use this to benefit outcomes for the young people so that's that's kind of how I do it. There's actually a question in the Q&A which 
I think you've kind of answered there as the question was coming in uh, from Connor, who said, I'm over here in Ireland, so I don't know your system. But would I chat about their intentions for various film elements help assessing their films? So kind of like you were saying there, Michael, a, a self-assessment, what were they trying to do? And is that what they've achieved? And how do they reflect on, on that? Sorry, Fraser, I know you were going to come in on Oh no, no, again, I, I agree. I think uh, what was what I was going to say was, um, especially at the the senior level, uh, what they got to do is one of the chapters they have to do is the creative intentions, in according to a brief. So you read that anyway, and they they they, they, they lay out what they're going to be doing for the film, and and in, in, in quite a tragic way as well, the more it goes wrong the more they have to write about in section two, which is a more reflective looking back of how close were they to achieving their creative intentions. So I, I think, and also with, with younger ones, Connor, uh, I think you'd be talking with them anyway. So uh, for example, if I've got a class of S2s, so you're talking about um, maybe 13 year olds in front of me, they'll be working in their groups and making plans anyway. I'll be going around and talking to them about what they're planning to do as, as well. So say um, the, the, the latest task is a horror film task. I'll, I'll be like, okay, so how are you going to hit those conventions? So you're saying about this scary place, what are you going to do for that? And they, would be, they should be able to tell me about that. I think a lot of it is basically talk, it's, it's verbal feedback and, and communication as well as a big form of assessment. And it's funny because you kind of mentioned film school there. Fraser, but but actually the way that you've explained that and Michael's explained that it's not different from what most university film and media courses are like now as well, which you make a film and you write a reflective essay and even in some of our modules we've let them assign themselves their own grade and they write their self-assessment because like you said it's so subjective, they have to write what they wanted to do beforehand, write whether they did it and they can give themselves self a grade. So it's good to see that although there are frequently uh, issues maybe with the SQA media exam that teachers talk about that and it's actually quite connected to what's going on at further and higher education and um, there's a question here from Gail Robertson who you probably all know from Screen Scotland she says how do you overcome the imbalance in media film studies for pupils who are brilliant in theory but not at the practical elements and vice versa especially given the writing demands of higher media And that's actually probably one of the biggest challenges um, and it's still something that through like years of trial and error I'm yet to get totally correct and I'm yet to perfect and think that really really worked and um, it can be really challenging for pupils that um, struggle with literacy um, to achieve um, within certificate media and um, I think National 5 is perhaps a bit more holistic um, especially in the exam, I find it a, a bit more holistic and a bit more comparable to social and history and um, getting their thoughts down on paper in that way, because one way that they're, they're sort of marked down in things like English is to do with their, their grammar and their sentence construction and their like being technically correct. And that's not quite the case in media, as long as your ideas are coming across and as long as the, the marker and the reader can sort of follow your intentions and follow your plan you will get credit for it, which is great, and you will be rewarded for your ideas, not necessarily the technical accuracy in which you put them down. Um, the, the big, it, it's the same in higher, but the, the biggest challenge at higher comes from the absolute momentous volume. Like it's, it's just so much that's expected for them. And it, I can't think of another a sort of portfolio or assignment within secondary teaching and in other subjects that, that's quite as massive is the sort of seven to 10,000 words that's been expected of high-end media. Um, I've experimented before with writing frames. Um, I've experimented with uh, like making thinking visible techniques and strategies and routines that gets them sort of prompting and think of, thinking of another sentence. Um, before COVID, we had them working a lot in groups. Production roles was removed. Um, so the group and sort of peer support and peer motivation would really help. Um, using supported study times and Saturday school times, but not framing it. The, the real sort of challenge that comes with supported studies is that you don't want to make it seem like an extra class that you need to come and do at the end of the day because you've missed something or you're not quite good enough at something else. So sort of making the supported study time for media as fun and informal and relaxed as possible because like a kid that is 
sort of worked up and wound up and worried and anxious and I can't do this and and has that sort of mindset isn't going to be able to do it it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy so I think that your relationships with a class can make a massive difference and um, like it really really does like relation that's what teaching is all about is about relationships and um, and I think using the sort of team and squad mentality that media can be to sort of use that as motivation and trying to sort of develop that sense of intrinsic motivation because I think that a pupil's own negative mindset about themselves can be part of the biggest barrier and I think just knowing that you're there to support and that you'll provide them with x y and z to make sure that they're able to do that and with quality feedback and extended feedback and like continual marking and just being there with them being part of their wee team makes a massive difference um but I, I absolutely agree um is it Gail that it is the biggest challenge it is something that we're all still trying to perfect since all still trying to do the best of um it's similar for practical media that group work made a massive difference in sort of the energy that they got from other people in their little team and in their production it was is really infectious and it really can pull along kids and get them on side and get them invested when they're working with someone that just absolutely loves this and just wants to make something that's really cool and like I, th I think that working together and peer support and can make a massive difference with it but I think that the teacher is also a peer in that scenario you're part of the support you're part of their we gang that's meant to help them and be there for them. Um, so I think that the more people that can be on site and in team media, the better and the, the, the more we can do for that. Wow. Right. Uh, well, again, what, what an answer, Jacqueline. <laughs> like, uh, and also, it's a really difficult question as well. Um, so thanks for that, Gail. Uh, <laughs> so um, I can only look, I can only approach this one in terms of being good at the theory, but not the practical elements, because and that's my experience with that. In the past, what I've kind of done is usually at that time before summer holidays with the timetable changes, I use that time to develop practical skills. And that way you're really involved in it as well. It's almost like you found a hole in our whole idea of letting the kids be facilitators, you know? Uh, uh, be, you know? So what I try to do is I try develop little short fun techniques like the, the, the transitions task uh, learn about camera shots going and doing that and at, at least they gain some kind of understanding uh, rather than just pointing and shooting as if they're, they're shooting like a drama on stage so with that I, I think it's a cliche always says practice makes perfect and, and then when they come back after the holidays I might do a week maybe a week and a half of like a, a, a summary course of working with techniques and camera shots like get, get them to film a dialogue scene, how you can do that, get them to film uh, even a one minute clip encompassing four different camera shots and think about that. And maybe that can try and spark something at them. But the other way around, it's always very difficult as well. As as Jacqueline, I think Jacqueline put, nailed it on the head there with the self fulfilling prophecy idea. That was amazing. Um, I totally forgot where I was going. I was so glad to listen. Um, so to get around the kind of disparity and the kind of equity, I suppose, with the volume of written work, the way I get buy-in is just, it's just, it's all about strategy. And, you, and, and I bang on about this with the learners all the time. It's about if you're not the strongest writer, that doesn't mean you can't get, you can't pass higher media. You know, 50% is the assignment that we work on all year. Like filmmaking is your passion watching and analysing films, your passion. It's about maybe utilising the strategies in Glasgow, all the kids have an iPad. So why are you not taking voice memos? Why, like, speak into your iPad, use those facilities to help you hit your word count. And if that's 50%, if you're thinking an A's, 70%, give or take. So if you pour your heart and soul into the thing that you're passionate about, which is the assignment, then let's let's deal with that and then let's go to the next part of strategy and the next part of breaking down the written element having a look at the marking scheme i think it's always a good way to go with kids show them exactly what they need to do so if you're wanting to break into six to five out of ten you only need to tell me about something in some detail and it's the word some and they're like i can do that and you're like yeah you can and then you need to talk to me the word and one more thing in lesser detail, can you do that? Yes, I can. And, and I think it's that buy-in 
that your most of your assessment is something that you really care about and you as the teacher foster that passion and have you seen this film and look at how they use camera shots and go away and look at it and just give me bullet points about it and talk to me about it and that's how I approach the written task to just especially for kids that are crashing it it's just you're having a conversation with me you just happen to be writing it down and they're like I can get on board with that and it's like so what do you know about the media what do you know about film language cool tell me about it where do we see it in the film tell me about it and it, it's, a, it's about that and I think that's how we deal with the kind of equity when it comes to the right side let's pour all our energy into the bit of the the kids are passionate about and then we just come up with a strategy for attacking the written element and then the written elements bonus marks and let's go for it so that that's how I do it Excellent. Thank you very much. I um, see your apology for the question there, Gail, but I thought I'd got out three terrific answers. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, kind of aware of time, so I wonder if we have, I was going to say, I wonder if we have any other questions, and then Liz has popped one in. Uh, she's asked, are National Five pupils allowed to scribe? Thumbs up and nods of the head for that one. That's a straightforward answer. Have we got any more um, questions from our attendees or is there anything else, Jacqueline, Michael and Fraser, you feel that you were wanting to cover that you maybe haven't quite got around to yet? Well, I would quite like to show a, one of my show deals of my kids' work, if, that, if that's okay with everyone, everyone here. This sure. is see an idea. So this uh, is my show deal of my S3 work we did this year. Sure. And basically what they did was... Um, I, for National Force, you're talking about 13 year olds, and they did a, a solo project on a film on a genre of their choice, looking at two films of that genre, and they worked through the key aspects, conventions, narrative, all the way through to institutions. And based and after that project, they had to make a film based on their research. So if the kids made a rom com, sorry, the research rom com, they would make a rom com. So that's the idea of it. So here we go. It's also a bit of fun as well. So here we go, guys. I'm going to. We tried this before, guys. It worked. So we're going to try it again. So, yes. Yes. Superb. Right. Then, <laughs> let's do this. And can everyone see that okay? Yep. There is no sound again, though. Yeah, this happened last time, and the sound did come in eventually. So let's hold our breath and see if it arrives. It's, it's worth the wait.
there we go. And we're back in the room. So, uh, pretty much what I did with them was, and I always say this to a lot of my kids, is the more you get from outside of school, the better. I, I try and encourage that because it deals with production value. So what in the past we've had is, or oh, obviously it's fine with S1, S2 kids, but with kids who are studying media and have chosen the subject, they want a production value. So what I don't want to see is someone make it build a bedroom in the drama studio because it looks like a bedroom built in a drama studio. Instead, why does film in a bedroom at home? So <laughs> simple things like that. And it really adds to these movies, you know, and I guess I, I couldn't be more proud of them. It's just, they're just like a great bunch of filmmakers. I just want to see what we call next. So there we go, Gaff, what we treat for you? That was absolutely right. That was so cool. Like seeing what you've worked on, seeing what you've worked on and produced is honestly so inspiring and it completely puts what I do to shame. <laughs> They're just so brilliant. Like you must be delighted. Yeah, it's fantastic. I think it's a really nice way to come towards the conclusion uh, of our panel there. Um, unless we have any more questions from the audience or final thoughts, I couldn't help but notice, Fraser, you better go and read some emails. It's like six and a half thousand unread emails. <laughs> that would give me the fear. <laughs> so stressful. So stressful. Oh, man, that reread icon, that would be tormenting me. Uh, there's That's... just one more question. So, um, sure. Connor Murphy oh, asking sorry. about if male film teachers have to have. Yes. <laughs> Normally there's, a baseball cap as well. There's just one more question about the males and, to film teachers. And, and the flip flops as well. Have to have beards. I would like to have it noted that and have beards as well. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, we can maybe, I think, Fraser, you said some of that stuff was online, didn't you? Um, yes. So, pretty much what I've done is there's a St. Mungo's Film School YouTube channel. Which the link is on my 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 Twitter page, Mr. Johnson eighty five. Shameless plug right there, but anyway, it is what it is. <laughs> but, uh, all my stuff. So the show reels for the the S three, my National five, and films from the past as well uh, are on there as well. So if you want to get a look at this, and oh, the one about the painting I was telling you about is on there. Have a look at that; it's fantastic to see. But yeah, have yeah, it's, like I said, it's all. This is why we do it. Moments like this. So. Well, well, thank you very much, Fraser. I suggest we all go and have a wee look at um, the St. Mungo YouTube channel. Look at that. Pascal, whatever the pro has got it in the chat there straight away. Excellent work. Uh, well, thank you very much to uh, Jacqueline, Michael and Fraser and to all our attendees for joining us uh, today. It was another, um, fan oh, there's Jacqueline, there we are. Uh, it was another fantastic session. Um, like I said, at the start, we do have another session tonight at 7.30. Uh, uh, with the uh, Academy Award nominee filmmaker John Sales. And then we have a whole bunch more panels tomorrow, starting at 11 o'clock, uh, and then another one at 2 o'clock uh, with me and some folk talking about the Scottish film education context again. And then two more filmmaker keynotes with Mike Figgis and Michelangelo Framartino. So if you can make it, it'd be good to see some of you again at those later on panels. But just to finish off here, thank you very much, Michael, Jacqueline and Fraser, and for Pascal doing all the work in the background. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Thank you. See Bye. you later. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.